Ayla for inviting me to give uh, a short lecture about diabetes. Okay, I think it has been a very long morning. I see that I see a lot of glazed look. <laughs> so uh, I just want to promise you that my next segment, uh, the 15 minutes, is going to be more practical tips. Okay, uh, for starters, um, who here have family members with diabetes? Okay, so you are no stranger to diabetes. Okay, so maybe I, I'm, while they're loading the slides, I just a bit of an impromptu. If I were to check your blood sugar right now, do you know what number is considered okay? Like five, some, I heard five. Under seven, some people say under seven is, is okay. Under 6.5, so I'm, I'm hearing numbers, five, six, it's almost like MCQ questions, you know, it will do something very well here. Okay, so um, there are a couple of different definitions from America, uh, from uh, World Health Organization, but simply put, we all agree that if we wake up and our blood sugar level is below six, we're quite comfortable, six and below, we're quite comfortable. Americans want it even stricter, 5.6 and below, okay? All right, and if it's above seven, then we start worrying about diabetes. And if it's in between, we worry about something called pre-diabetes. So, you know, we don't become diabetes overnight. <laughs> Unless you think that last night you went to chomp chomp and you ate, you know, <laughs> pan fried rice and your sugar became high in the morning. Okay, also, also that, by the way, this blood sugar is just a one-off reading, right? You can say, okay, never mind. For the next doctor's visit, I'm going to fast for 24 hours before I do the blood test. So that's why some people say, what about this thing called HbA1c? So who's familiar with HbA1c? I'm sure the previous um, speakers have spoken. So they, it's supposed to measure a three-month average of sugar. So how come so smart? How come the test? Do you all know how, how it does that? Hemoglobin, that's right. So in our, we have blood, hemoglobin, red blood cells. It runs in our body and lives in the body for three months before new red blood cells gets produced. So very simple, if over the three months, on average your sugar level happens to be higher, more blood sugar will stick onto your blood cells. So we can do a test that gives some idea of how your last three months been. There are, of course, since I'm dealing with a very smart, sophisticated crowd, so I'll give you a few uh, pitfalls, pitfalls. Some of you may have this thing called thalassemia. Have you heard of thalassemia? Thalassemia. So it's very common in Asians, in Southeast Asia. So we have thalassemia, where our blood count is actually lower. And in these people, we have to be careful. This HbA1c may be falsely lower. And make you feel very good about yourself, say, oh, actually I don't have diabetes. <laughs> okay, so this is some of the things. Why it's still good to talk to your GP, to your enlightened family doctor, or if necessary, to a specialist, to discuss what do these numbers mean. So I think earlier, uh, Dr. Nanda Kumar said, know your numbers. I agree, I, have, I totally agree. So I will encourage my patients, check your blood pressure, what's your, what's your blood pressure number? Check your cholesterol, what's your cholesterol numbers? Check your sugar before you eat, two hours after you eat, and your treatment average. Do the numbers make sense? And are we on the right track? Okay, I can see that um, they have some, uh, is it better to go over the, can? Thumb drive, yeah, easier, okay, all right. So sorry for the delay. Okay, all right. 
So I, earlier, we went through this already. Okay? Happy? We have some idea about the numbers. Okay. One more practical point. Sometimes when you go to a doctor, they measure glucose, they measure in different units. They either measure in millimoles per liter or milligrams per deciliter, which may make it a little bit confusing. Very simple. It's, it's one millimole per liter equals to 18 milligrams per deciliter. So I usually give my patients a, a certain conversion card. So whichever number, whichever lab they go to, you have an idea of what's considered good, what's, what's considered not so good, and how we can work from there. <laughs> okay? So the questions again I ask would be, what's your reading before eating, two hours after eating, and what's your three-month average? Okay, this is a classic description of diabetes in the, in the old, old, old days. Who here heard of people say, I worry about diabetes because I see ants being attracted to my urine. Even to this day, there are patients come to me, hand to heart, they come to me and say, hey, I'm very scared, I think I've got diabetes. Ants are attracted to urine, which makes you wonder, don't they flush the toilet? But anyway, that's a different story. Okay? Alright. Uh, not going to bore you with the, the official definition of diabetes, but diabetes mellitus, when you say blood sugar high, is an oversimplification. Oversimplification. It's actually a very complex disease, and every patient is actually slightly different. Okay? Early speaker talk about type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, but there are many other types. Like, I think in the newspaper, talk about pregnant women with diabetes, gestational diabetes, and there are a few other specific types all right, of diabetes. And I think earlier this year, uh, there are some experts from UK that talk about maybe five types of diabetes. So more and more research going on. But from my own personal observation, you know, previously I worked at SGH for about 14 years and came out prior practice one year. So the more I see patients with diabetes, I realize that you cannot put them into baskets. They are all very different. Their types of diabetes are actually very different and their approach is very, very unique. But if I were to oversimplify, if I were to oversimplify, because you all are given too many information, it can be very confusing. If I do oversimplify, at the end of the day, it's about the pancreas. The pancreas, okay? The pancreas is the organ that produces hormone called insulin. So I like to use the car analogy. So if your pancreas is a Ferrari engine, it doesn't matter what rubbish you eat, you don't get diabetes, okay? which is, of course, dependent on genes and maybe stress and a, a lot of other factors as well. But unfortunately, if genetically, you know, problem, if your father, your mother, your auntie, uncle all have diabetes, it means that you have susceptible genes. Most likely, I'm sorry, your pancreas not Ferrari. Lah. <laughs> not Ferrari. So then, of course, you have to talk about ways to help your engine to survive well, optimally, so that you don't get diabetes, okay? So that's how I, so normally your engine, this engine is very smart. At night when you're sleeping, it's in standby mode. So it's like you drive a car, red light, the, the engine still on. Unless your new car has the auto stop <laughs> function. But it's okay. Let's say you add a red light, it revs. It just produces a little bit of hormone to keep you going. And then the first meal of the day, breakfast. Of course, some people say, I skip breakfast. Okay, fine. Whatever your first meal of the day, you eat. You eat amount of carbs. Your engine need to rev up, need to produce a lot of insulin to bring down the blood sugar level. If the pancreas is not able to do that, your blood sugar level will spike up. Okay, so more or less you have the idea. So even in normal people, this I'm showing you the blood sugar trend in normal people in the 24 hours period, they will still.